الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المسلمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد رب شرح لي صدري وسلي أمري وحل أقدم من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم my dear respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to part fourteen of the Sira of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم series and today we will inshallah concentrate on the most famous battle in Islam, the Battle of Badr. Now, before we cover today's events, inshallah, let's have a quick recap of what we talked about in the previous session. Alhamdulillah, we covered events which took place in the second year of Hijri, in the previous session. We first started talking about how the original Qibla was Masjid al-Aqsa. But our Prophet wasallam used to yearn towards to pray towards the Kaaba. So when he came to Medina, he yearned towards to, yearned to pray towards the Kaaba. And 16 or 17 months after the Hijrah, after the migration, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses from Surah Baqarah. So the Prophet wasallam could now face Masjid al-Haram, face the Kaaba in Salah. We then talked about the Ashab al -Sufa. The poor people from the Muslim community and how our Prophet ﷺ used to make arrangements to ensure that they were looked after. They were given a place to stay in Masjid al Nabawi. Each evening, the Prophet ﷺ would distribute the people from the Ashab al-Sufa amongst the companions so those who were able to could take them home and feed them. And we also heard how some of the Sahaba anhum took up to 80 of the Ashab al-Sufa at home to feed them. SubhanAllah. The Prophet ﷺ also made provisions in the way that inside the masjid two ropes used to be kept on which were tied certain fruits. So what how would happen was the Sahaba would bring bunches of fruits, whether they were dates or whatever, and hang them on these ropes. And whenever the Ashab Sufa felt like they needed to eat from them, they would use a stick and hit the fruit, the fruit would come down and they would be able to eat from them. We also heard how the commandments from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now started to increase. Now we have to remember my brothers and sisters, all of the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were not compulsory straight away. They happened gradually and now Islam had been or was in the ascendancy, it had a home in Medina. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now started increasing the commands. We heard about the fasting in the month of Ramadan and how it became compulsory. And remember, before the fast in the month of Ramadan, the compulsory fast was the fast of Ashura, the 10th of Muharram. And now it was the fasting in the month of Ramadan. Again, we heard the verses from Surah Baqarah. We also heard how at the end of the month, the Salat al-Eid al-Fitr and Sadqat al-Fitr also took place. And again, we heard these verses from Surah Al-A'la. And then we heard, about the Salat al-Eid al-Adha and the Udhiya, the, karba, the Qurbani or the sacrifice. Again, we heard the verses which were revealed in Surah Qawthar with regards to this. And finally, we talked about the Durud, the commandment where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the believers to send Salat and Salam on our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This also happened in this year and also according to many opinions, Zakah, our charity that we give, also became uh, compulsory in this year. We then concentrated on the various expeditions which our Prophet ﷺ either took part in or he ordered. Now we remember there were two terms that we used. The first term we used was Ghazwa. Ghazwas are referred to as those expeditions in which our Prophet ﷺ himself personally took part in. And then we have the Saraya and these were the expeditions which were ordered by himself but he never actually physically took part in them himself. So, we started off talking about Ghazwa, with the Ghazwa, about the Ghazwa of Abwa. And this was the first expedition in which our Prophet wasallam, like I mentioned, was involved with personally. He travelled with 60 Muhajireen, 60 Muslims from the migrants from Mecca. There was no Ansar in this party. And he travelled to Abwa, and there he agreed terms with the tribe of the Banu Zamra. No hostilities took place. We then talked about other battles, for example, the Ghazwa Bawat and Al Ushira and Safwan. Again, in all of these expeditions, no hostilities took place. We then heard how our Prophet ﷺ sent one of the companions, Hazrat Abdullah bin Jahash. 
And he sent him with some companions with a letter and told them, don't open this letter until after two days. Now, one of the facts that I forgot to mention in the previous session that Hazrat Abdullah bin Jahash who was related to our Prophet وسلم, in two ways. Firstly, he was a cousin of the Prophet وسلم, and secondly, his sister Zainab anha, was also one of the wives or became one of the wives of the Prophet وسلم, so he also became his brother-in-law. Now, Prophet وسلم, gave them instructions in this letter to go to a place called Nakhla which was located between Ta'if and Makkah and wait there and while they were there to send information about what the Quraysh were doing. While they were there, they came across a Qurayshi caravan. Now, an arrow was shot by the Muslims at the leader of the caravan and the rest of the caravan ran away. They managed to secure the goods and also two prisoners. And this was the first booty in Islam, the first balls of war. Hazrat Abdullah bin Jahash radiallahu ta'ala anhu Use his own ijtihad, he divided the goods into five parts and reserved one-fifth for the Prophet ﷺ, and the rest was divided amongst the people in the party. Upon returning to Medina, the Prophet ﷺ had told him that they had not been given permission to fight and that they had to wait until the revolution came, or sorry, the revelation came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to tell them what to do with this booty and to tell them what to do with the prisoners of war. Furthermore, this had happened in one of the sacred months in which at that time fighting was not allowed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then revealed the following verse which we talked about in detail in Surah Baqarah where he addresses the Prophet sallallahu and he tells him about them asking you with regards to the blessed months or the sacred months and fighting in it. Now let's start off talking about today's subject matter. In the second year of Hijri, there were a total of eight Ghazawat. And Ghazwa Badr al Kubra was the first proper battle or in the history of Islam. It was the fifth expedition in which the Prophet ﷺ was involved with personally. And this was within the space of the year. In the beginning of Ramadan, in the second year of Hijri, the Prophet ﷺ received news that Abu Safiyan bin Harab was returning back to Mecca with a trade caravan from the Quraysh and this caravan was coming back from Syria from Sham and the caravan was full of goods and there were either 30 or 40 men in this caravan. The Prophet ﷺ gathered his companions and told them about this caravan and told them about the goods in it and the possibility that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes they could acquire this wealth that was in the caravan. Now, at that moment in time, there was no thought of any type of conflict or fighting, so the Muslims set off without any preparation for battle. Now, Abu Sufyan had thought that the Muslims might come to try and intercept the caravan. So when he got close to the Hijaz, now Hijaz is a term used for the main mass or land mass of Arabia. So before he got close, or before he when he got close to the Hijaz, he started asking all of the other travellers that he would meet on the way about any such news, whether they had heard about Muhammad and the Muslims coming to try and intercept his caravan. Abu Sufyan then received some news from some travellers who said that Muhammad has commanded his followers to travel towards your caravan. As soon as he heard this, Abu Sufyan hired Dham Dham Ghifari and told him to go at once to Makkah and tell the Quraysh to come to your caravan, come to your wealth as soon as you can and save your wealth because Muhammad وسلم, has commanded his followers to travel towards it. And Dham Dham Ghafari left for Makkah straight away. Now, you can see from this close-up of the map, the direction or the general direction in which the caravan was traveling from the land of Sham to Makkah, inshallah. We will go through this in a bit more detail later on. So meanwhile, our Prophet وسلم, left with his companions and headed towards the caravan on the 12th of Ramadan. The number of people who the Prophet وسلم, was with was either 313, 314, 315, 319, depending on various narrations and depending on different opinions. But we know there were just over 300 people. Now we have to remember that times were very hard for the Muslims in those days. Between the whole army, they only had two horses. 
one horse belonged to Hazrat Zubair bin Awam radiallahu ta'ala anhu and the other to Miqdad radiallahu ta'ala anhu and the whole army only had 70 camels in total and each camel was allotted to approximately three Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu so all of them took turn in riding the animals our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa initially took turns with Hazrat Abu Lubaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu and when the turn used to come for our Prophet وسلم, to walk, both of the companions used to say to the Prophet وسلم, that you carry on riding and we will walk in your place. Our Prophet وسلم, used to say to them, he said, that you are not stronger than me in walking and I am no less desiring of Allah's reward than you. Subhanallah. Now think about this, my brothers and sisters. Our Prophet وسلم, at this time, this is the second year of Hijrah. That he has been a prophet for 13 years in Makkah. He attained prophethood at 40. So 40 plus the 13 in Makkah, that's 53 plus another two years, that's 55 years of age, subhanAllah. 55 years of age and still he is volunteering himself to walk towards Badr. Now Prophet وسلم, with his companions reached a place called Bire Abi I'naba, which was one mile outside of Medina. A Prophet ﷺ checked the whole group and whoever he deemed was younger of age was sent back to Medina. Then at Maqam Roha, which is another place, Hazrat Abu Ubaba bin Abdul Mandir who, who we just talked about recently, who was sharing the camel with our Prophet, ﷺ, he was chosen to overlook matters in Medina and was sent back. So whenever our Prophet وسلم, used to go on an expedition, he used to leave someone in charge of affairs in Medina, so Abu Lubaba radiallahu was sent back. Then, Abdullah ibn Umm Makhtoum radiallahu had also been left behind to read Salah in Medina. And we can remember, as Abdullah ibn Umm Makhtoum radiallahu was one of the illustrious mu'addins of our Prophet sallallahu he used to do the adhan. And he was also the Sahaba who was blind about whom the Surah Abbas wa was also revealed. Now, again, let's talk about the preparation the army had. In the whole Muslim army, there were only three spears. One belonging to Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, another to Hazrat Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and the third belonged to one of the Ansar. When they got near to Maqam Safra, again, this is the name of another place, then Amr Jahni and Adi radiallahu ta'ala anhuma were both sent by a Prophet وسلم, to go ahead and try and find out information about the caravan of Abu Sufyan. So on one hand, we had these two Sahabas who were going to find information about the caravan. And on the other hand, Abu Sufyan has sent Zamzam Ghafari on his way to Makkah to convey the message to the Quraysh that the caravan is under threat and come quickly to the rescue. Now, our Prophet وسلم, we talked in the second session when we talked about the lineage of our Prophet وسلم, that he had many uncles and aunts. And one of his aunts who lived in Makkah at that time was name was Artika and she was the daughter of Abdul Muttalib. So she was the sister of our Prophet وسلم's father Abdullah. Now Dhamdham Ghafari had been sent by Abu Sufyan to go and tell the Quraysh that they must come and protect the caravan as the Muslims are approaching. And three days before he arrived in Makkah, a Prophet Sallallahu aunt Atika had a dream which frightened her. Now in her dream, she saw that a rider came on his camel and he reached a place called Abta. Then when he got there, he said in a loud voice, he said, Oh, the people of Ghadr, meaning the people of Quraysh, Leave for the place of your defeat in three days. This is what he said. Leave for the place of your defeat in three days. The people then gathered around him. This happened in her dream. And he then took his camel and went into Masjid al-Haram. He said the same words there. And then he climbed upon one of the mountains which was called Jabal al-Qubais and again repeated his warning. He then threw a boulder from the top of this mountain and when it reached the bottom, it smashed into places. And there was not a house in Mecca in which a piece of this boulder didn't land. So this was the dream that our Prophet Sallallahu auntie Atika had seen. After seeing this dream, she told her brother Hazrat Abbas about it and said that she fears 
that some calamity is going to come and strike the people. Now, when he heard of this dream from her, he told her not to mention the dream to anybody. Has Abbas anhu came out of his house and saw his friend Walid bin Utbah. He told him about his sister's dream and made him promise not to tell anyone. So Atika has told the dream to Abbas anhu. He's told her not to tell anyone about it, but he in turn tells his friend Walid bin Utbah. Walid then tells his father Utbah. And in this way, news of this dream reached the whole of Makkah. Now in Ibn Hisham, Abbas anhu says that I went into the Haram in the morning to perform Tawaf and saw that Abu Jahal was sitting with a group of people. They were discussing Atika's dream. When Abu Jahal saw me, he said, Oh Abu Al-Fadl. So Abu Al-Fadl was the kunya, the technonym of Hazrat Abbas anhu. He said to him, Oh Abu Al-Fadl, when you finish from your Tawaf, come to us. When I finished, I went to them and I sat with them. Abu Jahal then addressed Abbas and he said that your men made claims of prophethood. Yes, so here he is referring to our Prophet So he says, your men made claims of prophethood and now your women have also started to make claims of prophethood. This again was referring to Atika's dream. But Abbas asked him, he says, what matter, what, what matter are you talking about? And he told him about Atika's dream. On the morning of the third day, Dham Dham Ghafari turned up to Makkah, shouting Abu Sufyan's message. He said, O oh, people of Quraysh, go and see to your caravan and go as quickly as you can to help Abu Sufyan's party. To Quraysh answered the call and went to Badr. Here they will see the interpretation of Atika's dream with their own eyes. Now there is a difference of opinion as to whether Atika embraced Islam or not. Ibn Sa'ad mentions that she did embrace Islam and she migrated towards Medina later on. Now as soon as the news had reached Makkah, it created a large disturbance because there was no man or woman in Makkah who hadn't invested heavily in that caravan. So everyone's wealth was under threat. 1,000 men, armed to the hilt, fully prepared and provisioned for battle, left Makkah with Abu Jahl in the lead. Singing women also accompanied the army as well as drums and this is the way they left full of pride and pomp Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this in surah al-anfar in the Quran His a'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim bismillah ar-rahman rahim wala takunu kalladhin kharaju min diyarihim bataran wa ri'a'a an-nas wa yasudduna 'an sabili Allah wa Allah bima ya'maluna muhit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and do not be like those people who came out of their houses full of pride and showing off to the people. So he is referring to the Quraysh. And they stopped people from the path of Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all encompassing of whatever actions they do. Approximately all of the leaders of the Quraysh joined the expedition apart from Abu Lahab. Now we remember Abu Lahab being the uncle of our Prophet and for some reason he could not come. In his place he sent Abu Jahal's brother As bin Hisham. Now As bin Hisham owed Abu Lahab 4,000 dirhams and because he had become poor he didn't have the means to pay back his debt and because he was under pressure due to this debt he accepted to join the expedition in place of Abu Lahab. Umayyah bin Khalaf had also initially refused to join the expedition, but Abu Jahl's insistence made him also join. Now, what was the reason for Umayyah's initial refusal? Let's have a look. The reason for Umayyah's initial refusal was that Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was from the Ansar, used to be his friend. Whenever Umayyah used to go to Sham, used to go to Syria, he would stop by Medina and visit Hazrat Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And whenever Hazrat Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu used to go to Makkah, he would visit Umayyah bin Khalaf in return. After Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated to Medina, on one occasion, Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu went to Makkah to perform Umrah. And as per his normal practice, he stayed in the house of Umayyah bin Khalaf. He told Umayyah, he said, 
take me to perform tawaf at a time when the haram is empty, meaning when there are no crowds. Umayyah took Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu in the late morning to perform tawaf. They were doing tawaf when Abu Jahal saw them and he said, O oh, Abu Sufyan, which was the kunya of Umayyah bin Khalaf. He said, Who is this person with you? Umayyah said, This is Sa'ad. Abu Jahal said, That I am seeing that this person is performing the tawaf calmly. You are giving unreligious people like this a place to stay and you are also helping them. He then addressed Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu and he said, Oh Sa'ad, I swear by my Lord, that if Umayyah was not with you, then you would not return in a proper state. The Hazrat Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu then said in a loud voice, he said, if you stop me from Tawaf, then I swear by my Lord that I will stop your road from Medina to Sham. As we know, this road was the lifeline to the trade in Mecca, because the trade route, the Meccans, the Quraysh used to take on the way to Sham, used to pass by Medina. So Hazrat Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu threatened to perform a blockade on that route for the Qurayshi caravans. Umayyah then said to Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu he said, don't raise your voice against Abu Jahl. He is the leader of this valley. Sa'ad radiallahu said, leave it. He said, I swear by my Lord that I have heard from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi that you will die at the hands of those who are beloved to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Umayyah said, Will I die in Mecca? Sa'ad Radilan said, That I don't know. Where and when you will be killed. After hearing this, Umayyah got very worried and frightened. He went and told his wife about what had been said. In one narration, it mentioned that he said, I swear by my Lord that Muhammad never says anything wrong. He got so frightened that he made the intention that he would never leave Mecca. So when Abu Jahl told the people to leave for Badr, Umayyah found it very hard. He was scared for his life. Abu Jahl saw that he wasn't ready to leave. So he said to him, he said, that you are a leader of the people. And if you don't go, then other people would see this and they will also refuse to go. Abu Jahl kept on insisting, kept on insisting that Umayyah comes with them, that he joins their army. Abu Jahl then said to Umayyah, he said, look, he said, I will buy you an excellent and expensive horse and the meaning behind this was that as soon as you see a threat you can get on this horse and come back Umayyah then agreed with them to go to Badr he went home and told his wife to get his provisions ready she said to him don't you don't you remember the words of your Yathribi brother meaning Hazrat Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu anhu Umayyah said look my intention is that I go a little distance with them and then come back again so with this intention, Umayyah left. Wherever he would stop, he would keep his mount close. But destiny and Allah's decree stopped him from escaping. He reached Badr and soon we shall listen to what happened to him. Now the standard of the Muslim army or the flag was given to Hazrat Musa bin Umayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Ibn Hisham mentions that it was white in colour. And in front of the Muslim army, there were also two black flags. One was being carried by Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu. This flag was called al uqab and the other was in the hands of a Ansari. I mentioned earlier that the camels were being shared between three people. Our Prophet sallallahu was now sharing with Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu. And in Ibn Hisham, it mentions that the other was Marthad bin Abi Marthad al radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So he had taken the place of Hazrat Abu Lubaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Then Hazrat Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu was sharing his camel with Zayd bin Haritha, Abu Kabsha and Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Abdul Rahman bin Awf radiallahu ta'ala anhu were also sharing one camel. So now the Muslim army left Roha and reached an area or place called maqam safra Hazrat Basbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Adi radiallahu ta'ala anhu now came and told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the Quraysh had left Makkah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then gathered the Muhajiri and the Ansar to decide what to do. Remember, they hadn't planned on meeting an army from Makkah full of Quraysh. What they had only intended was to intercept the caravan. 
So he called up Sahaba عنهم, together and informed them of how the Quraysh had left. Hazrat Abu Bakr عنهم, was the first to speak and he expressed his willingness to follow our Prophet وسلم, his commands, whatever they were. And then Umar stood, stood up and also expressed a similar desire. Other Sahaba عنهم, also spoke, including Mikdad bin Aswad and Sa'ad bin Mu'adh. Our Prophet وسلم, became very happy after hearing the Sahaba عنهم, and said, On Allah's name, he said, Walk on Allah's name and there is glad tidings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised me that we will be helped and victorious over one of the two groups. So what were the two groups? Either Abu Sufyan's caravan or the army which was going to be led by Abu Jahal, the army of the Quraysh. Our Prophet sallallahu also said that I have been shown the places where certain people will perish, where they will be killed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions a revelation with regards to this incident. He says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وَإِذْ يَعِيدُكُمُ اللَّهُ إِحْدَى الطَّائِفَتَيْنِ But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised you one of the two groups أَنَّهَا لَكُمْ That it would be yours وَتَوَدُّونَ أَيْنَ غَيْرَ ذَاتِ الشَّوْكَةِ And you wished that the unarmed one would be yours meaning the one that would be the caravan yeah, that it will be for you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended to establish the truth by his words. And to eliminate the disbelievers. So you can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen that they would encounter the army and they would overcome them. Now let's look at the place of Badr in a bit more detail. You can see from the slide in front of you that Badr lies to the southwest of Medina and is about 150 kilometers or 100 miles away as you can see. Our Prophet sallallahu had sent had sent Hazrat Basbas and Adi radiallahu ta'ala anhu to go and spy on Abu Sufyan's camp. They reached Badr and under a hill there was a spring. So they rested their camels there. While they were there, they could see that two women were having a conversation. One of which was asking the other to repay her debt. So from the two women, one of them owed another one money. The woman who was being asked said that after two or three days, Abu Sufyan's caravan is going to come back from Sham. When it comes, I will work, and with whatever I earn, I will repay your debt. Now, what used to happen in Badr is there used to be a market. So, obviously, being a market, the caravans would come, set up the market, do some trading, etc. So, this woman said, after two or three days, Abu Sufyan's caravan is going to come back from Sham, and when it comes, she's going to work and get the money to repay the debt. Now, Majdi bin Amr was also present at the spring when the two women were talking. When she said that the caravan is going to come, he said, she's saying the truth. So he managed to help her convince the other woman yeah, to delay the payment. As soon as Basbas and Adi radiallahu ta'ala anhuma heard of this, they got on their camels and went back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and informed him of the news that the caravan is going to come by this way. So this is how they knew it was going to come to Badr. Now, after Basbas and Adi radiallahu ta'ala who left, Abu Sufyan and his caravan reached the same place whilst he was inquiring about the Prophet sallallahu Now again you can see the slide in front of you, the blue arrows show the path that the caravan had taken to Badr. Abu Sufyan then arrived at Badr and saw Majdi bin Amr and he asked him, he said, have you seen anyone come or go from this place? Majdi said, I haven't seen anyone apart from two people who were sat under this mountain and this hill. They set their camels down, they gave them water and filled their water skins. Then they left. Abu Sufyan quickly made his way to the location where the two men had sat and saw some camel droppings. He broke one of the droppings and found a date stone in it. He saw this date stone and said, I swear by my Lord that this date stone is 
from Yathrib. So he immediately realized that the Muslims had arrived at this point. He quickly went back to his caravan and diverted the direction of it towards the sea path. So this isn't the normal path the caravan would take. Again, you can see by the blue arrows the path he took. This way he managed to navigate the caravan safely back to Mecca, avoiding confrontation with the Muslim party. So you can see the caravan has now taken the path close to the sea and then across to the east towards Mecca. Abu Sufyan then sent another message to the Quraysh saying, You had come out to save your caravan and your men and your wealth. Allah has saved everyone. Therefore, you should all return to Mecca. Abu Jahal then said that until we reach Badr and for three days we eat, drink and enjoy ourselves, until then we will definitely not return. Now, Akhnas bin Sharik was a leader of the Banu Zahra. He addressed his tribe and he told them that they had only come to protect their wealth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has saved it, so there is no need for us to fight. Why should we put ourselves in danger like this man is saying, meaning Abu Jahal? All of the people of the Banu Zahra listened to Akhnas bin Sharik and went back. None of them were involved in the Battle of Badr. A Prophet wasallam now reached Badr with his companions. You can see by the green arrows in the slide in front of you the path that the Muslim army had taken from Medina to get to Badr. So on one side, you had the Qurayshi caravan, which has avoided confrontation with the Muslims. You can see the path the Muslims had taken to reach Badr. And now you can see the path that the Quraysh had taken to get to Badr as well. First of all, they traveled north past Al-Jamum until they got to Usfan. Then they went north past Khalis to Qadid. And from Qadid, they went in a northwesterly direction towards Wadan. And then they turned north past Amal Barak onto Badr. The total distance that the Quraysh went was about 200 miles or 300 kilometers. Now let's look at the area of Badr itself in more detail. This is a present day bird's eye view of the battlefield. We can see the location of the cemetery where the martyrs have been buried after the battle. Now from this slide you can see the path of the Muslim army which had come from the north towards the battlefield of Badr. So this is marked by the green arrows. And the Qurayshi army had come from the south and you can see that they had come and you can see the location of, uh, what do you call it again, the direction in which they approached the battlefield of Badr and this is marked by the red arrows. In this slide you can see further close up. So you can see the battlefield and the direction in which both of the armies approached it. You can also see the location of the spring, which was to the southeast of the battlefield, and also the location of the station of our Prophet ﷺ, his station during the battle, which we will talk about later. Now, one thing we have to remember is this whole area was surrounded by mountains and surrounded by dunes as well. So the Quraysh arrived first and took over the water spring. So the first thing they did, they secured the source of water. They had also chosen the most suitable places to set up camp as well. So the Muslims had no water and no good place to set up camp. The plain of Badr was sandy. It was difficult to walk on. The feet would sink into the ground when trying to walk on it. So imagine how difficult it would be to actually fight on it. You can see from this picture, present day, what the battlefield of Badr looks like. So if anybody have been to Badr, they would see it. If you haven't, then this is a picture in front of you of what the battlefield of Badr looks like today. So now, we talked about how the terrain was very sandy and the feet would stick inside it. Yeah. So what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the rain. The rain made the ground hard and easy to walk on. The Muslims then made small holes that they could collect the rainwater and use it for performing ghusl and wudu. In Surah Al-Anfal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذْ يُغَشِّكُمُ nas." And remember when, we, when he overwhelmed you with drowsiness, أَمَنَةً minhu, giving security from him. وَيُنَزِّلُ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَعْنِ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down rain from the skies upon you. 
upon you so that you may purify yourselves with it. Yeah, so you can do wudu, you can do ghusl, etc. And remove from you the impurity of shaitan. And make your heart strong. And your feet remain steadfast. So this is the surah, the revelation, which is in Surah Al-Anfal, which talks about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the water down for the Muslims in the time of Badr. Now, even though this water had been collected for the Muslims, our Prophet Sallallahu even gave permission to the enemies to use the water. SubhanAllah. When the evening came, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Zubair bin Awam radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas radiallahu ta'ala and some other sahabas to go and see what the Quraysh are doing. Coincidentally, they came upon two of the Quraysh slaves and started to question them. Prophet Sallallahu at that time was reading Salah. So he's reading Salah and the Sahaba are questioning these slaves. The slaves said that we have come out to collect water for the Quraysh. The Sahaba did not believe them. And after pressing them, the two men said that they were from the companions of Abu Sufyan. When they heard it, the Sahaba left them alone. A Prophet completed his Salah and said that when these two men said the truth, you started to hit them. And when they lied, you let them go. By Allah, these are the Quraysh's men. The Prophet ﷺ asked them where the Quraysh were. They said that they were behind a mountain called Muqanwas. In another narration, it mentions that they were behind a dune. So the Prophet ﷺ knew that these two slaves were not from the caravan of Abu Sufyan, but they were from the army of the Quraysh. The Prophet ﷺ then ask them how many they were. Again, this is an example of the wisdom of our Prophet ﷺ. He was the most wise person ever to set foot upon this planet. He asked these two, he said, how many were there? How many people were there in the Qurayshi army? They said there were a lot. The Prophet ﷺ said, how many are there? They said, we don't know the number. Our Prophet ﷺ then asked, he said, how many camels are slaughtered every day to feed the army? Now listen to the reply. The reply was that, Sometimes nine and sometimes ten. Our Prophet ﷺ knew that in order to feed 100 people, one camel needs to be slaughtered. So when they said between nine and ten, our Prophet ﷺ knew that the number of the people in the army is approximately between 900 and 1,000. So this is the way the Prophet ﷺ determined the size of the army. They were then asked about the leaders of the Quraysh. Who had come from them? They said that the following had come. Some of the names they mentioned were Shaiba bin Rabi'a, Abu al-Bakhtari bin Hisham, Hakim bin Hizam, Nawfal bin Khuwaylid, Hadith bin Amir bin Nawfal, Tu'ima bin Adi bin Nawfal, Nadr bin Al-Harith, Zamata bin Al-Aswad, Abu Jahal bin Hisham, and Umayya bin Khalaf, and many more. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa heard this, he faced the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala and said, Today, Makkah, has thrown its liver towards you. That means the pride of Makkah, the noble, they have all come. And this was the way our Prophet ﷺ found out about the size of the army and who was going to be in the army as well. When the morning arrived, our Prophet ﷺ made preparation for battle. A canopy was built on one of the mounds for the Prophet ﷺ on the advice of Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu anhu. And from this mound, the whole battlefield could be seen. Now from the book map in the book Atlas Tariqi, which is what I use quite often, this is the location where it says the station of our Prophet ﷺ was, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best as to the exact location. Prophet ﷺ spent the whole night in supplication and praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Fajr time came, our Prophet ﷺ called the Sahabas, he said, As-salatu ibadullah, O servants of Allah, the time for salah has arrived. As soon as the Sahaba anhum heard the call, they gathered together. Our Prophet وسلم, led salah and after he encouraged the Sahaba anhum, It was Friday, the 17th of Ramadan. On one side were the forces of truth, the forces of haqq, and on the other, the forces of falsehood, the forces of bathing. Our Prophet وسلم, straightened the rows of the Sahaba anhum, 
The Quraysh had also prepared their battle lines. When the Prophet saw the Quraysh army in all its splendor proceeding towards the battlefield, he supplicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help against the people who had rejected his messenger, who had come to the battlefield full of pride and haughtiness. He asked for help, which was promised to him. Now from this side, you can see the formation of the battle lines. The Quraysh were to the south and the Muslims were to the north. We know that the number of people in the Muslim army averaged or just over 300 and the Quraysh army was between 900 and 1000. So they outnumbered more than 3 to 1. The Muslim army was arranged into three groups. One group was for those people with swords, one group for those people with spears and then the archers and then the cavalry. We know that the cavalry was only made up of two horses which belonged to Miqdad and Zubair Tahu. We also know that the spears, there were only three spears in the whole army. So you can see how under-equipped, how ill-prepared the Muslim army was on that day. While our Prophet ﷺ was straightening the battle lines, he had an arrow in his hand. One companion, Hazrat Sawad bin Ghazia was slightly forward. So our Prophet ﷺ poked him lightly with the arrow and he said, Istawu ya Sawad, stand straight O Sawad. Sawad radiallahu ta'ala who said, O oh, Prophet of Allah وسلم, you have caused me distress. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent you with truth and justice. I want my revenge, I want retribution. A Prophet sallallahu alayhi lifted his garment from his stomach and he said to Sawad, he said, take your revenge. Sawad radiallahu ta'ala anhu then embraced the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and kissed him on his stomach and said, O oh, Rasulullah, maybe this is our last meeting. This may be our last meeting, subhanAllah. The Prophet was amused by what happened and made dua for Sawad radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The Prophet then went to the tent, the canopy, accompanied by Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And Hazrat Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala stood at the door of the canopy with his sword in hand. The Quraysh sent Ghamir bin Wahab to look at the Muslim army. He got on his horse and checked out the army and he returned. He said to them that, give or take, there are about 300 people, but give me some time so I can check whether they have any reinforcements hidden anywhere, because there's lots of dunes, there's lots of mountains. It could be that they've kept a force hidden somewhere else which can come to their aid when needed. He went around far and wide this time and came back and confirmed there were no reinforcements. Ghamir also said one more thing. He said, that heavy losses would be inflicted upon their army if they decided to fight. And what enjoyment would there be to life? So think before you decide what to do. Hakim bin Hizam said, you are right. And he went to Utbah and told him to take his army back. Utbah then addressed the army and said that there is no benefit in fighting Muhammad wasallam and his companions. They are all your kith and kin. Remember, the Muslims were related to the people of the Quraysh. Yeah? Some of them were their brothers, some of them were their fathers, some of them were their cousins, some of them were their uncles. So he said that the result will be that you will keep seeing the killers of your father and brother and your cousins. Leave Muhammad wasallam and the Arabs. If the Arabs put an end to Muhammad wasallam, then your job will be done. And if Allah SWT gives him victory, then this will also be a means of honour and respect for you. Don't go against my advice. Hakim bin Hizam says, I went to Abu Jahl. At the time he was putting on his armour and weapons. I said, Utbah has sent me with this message. As soon as he heard it, he became very angry and got up and said, the reason why Utbah does not want to fight is that his son Abu Hudayfa stays with the Muslim army, subhanAllah. So he said that he didn't want to fight because he didn't want any harm to come to his son. Abu Jahl swore an oath on Allah and said that they will definitely not go back until a decision is made between them and Muhammad He then called Amir bin Hadrami, the brother of Amr bin Hadrami. Now Amr bin Hadrami had been killed in Nakhla by Waqi bin Abdullah. When the Muslims had got their first beauty in the uh, booty, sorry, in the saraya, saraya led by Abdullah bin Jahsh anhu, so the Quraysh wanted revenge for his killing. He then told Amir that Utbah wants to take the people back, and your brother was killed in front of you. 
when Amr heard this, he started to say his brother's name. And he kept on saying his brother's name until the whole army got ready to fight. Now before I go on and talk about the actual battle itself, I wanted to mention a very special point. We have to remember it was not only the Sahaba who made great sacrifice when going out on their expeditions, but also their wives, their children and parents who remained behind. How many of them would not see their menfolk or would see their menfolk going off for an expedition and not know whether they would ever see them ever again? Hafiz Asqalani mentions one such Sahabia who was the mother of Awf and Mu'awad Inshallah we shall talk about them in a bit more detail later on and she was called Afra anha, and she has one special quality that no other person has she was first married to Harith and through Harith she had three sons Awf, Mu'awad and Mu'awad radiallahu ta'ala anhu. later on she then married Bakir bin Abdayalay and from him she had a further four sons Iyas, Aqil, Khalid and Amir radiallahu ta'ala anhu. All seven of her sons took part in the battle of Badr subhanallah. No other woman can make a similar claim where so many of their children took place in the battle of Badr. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept her sacrifice and the sacrifice of all of her children. Now going back to the battle, after Abu Jahal's remarks, the Qurayshi army, we heard how Amir encouraged the army as well, so now they are getting ready to fight. Utbah now also gets ready for battle. He takes his brother Sheba and son Walid and walks into the battlefield. He then called out for a challenge. Now in those days what used to happen is whenever they used to go for a battle, before the main battle would commence, there would be challenges, there would be certain duels that would take place. So these three people walked forward from the Qureshi side and asked for a challenge. Three men walked forward from the Muslim army. Hazrat Awf bin Harith, Hazrat Mu'awad bin Harith and Abdullah bin Rawaha radiallahu ta'ala anhum. The three Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala went into the field of battle and Utbah asked them who they were. They replied that we are from the Ansar. Utbah replied that we have no need of you. We want to fight with people from our own tribe. One person from the Qureshi army then cried. He said, Oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, send people from our people who are our match. A Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then gave the command for the three Ansari Sahaba to return to the battle ranks. A Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then called Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Hazrat Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and Ubaidah ibn Harith radiallahu ta'ala by name and told them to go and fight. Subhanallah. The three glorious companions went forward with their faces covered. When they reached the Quraysh, Utbah asked, he said, who are you? Ubaidah radiallahu ta'ala said, I am Ubaidah. Ali radiallahu ta'ala said, I am Ali. And Hamza radiallahu ta'ala said, I am Hamza. Utbah said, yes, you are our match. The duels then started. Utbah versus Ubaidah radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Shayba versus Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And Walid versus Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. As Ali radiallahu ta'ala and Hamza radiallahu put an end to their opponents immediately with a single stroke. Ubaidah radiallahu ta'ala during his challenge or during his duel with Utbah got wounded and Utbah also got wounded. Utbah then brought his sword down upon Ubaidah radiallahu ta'ala anhu and cut both his feet. After their duels had been won, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Hamza radiallahu ta'ala went to the aid of Ubaidah radiallahu ta'ala anhu and put an end to Utbah once and for all. They lifted Ubaidah radiallahu ta'ala anhu and took him to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Blood was flowing from his legs, subhanAllah. He said to a Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Am I shaheed? Am I a martyr? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Yes. According to some sources, Ubaidah radiallahu ta'ala anhu was 62 years old at the time when he got martyred. After Utbah and Sheba were defeated, the battle began. A Prophet وسلم, on seeing the small number of his loved ones and the large number of enemies and the lack of weapons and armor on his army and the strength of the army stood for salah. He read two salah and started to supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
In a hadith narrated in Sahih Muslim, Umar ibn al-Khattab narrates that on the day of Badr, the Prophet sallallahu looked towards the mushriks and they were a thousand and his companions were 390 men. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, faced towards Qibla and then he stretched his hands and started to supplicate his Lord. He said, O oh Allah, accomplish for me what you have promised me. O oh Allah, bring about what you have promised me. O oh Allah, if this group of Muslims is destroyed, you will not be worshipped on this earth. The Prophet وسلم, continued to supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while stretching his hands facing the Qibla until his mantle fell off his shoulder. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu came and picked up the mantle and put it back on his shoulders. Then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu embraced the Prophet وسلم, from behind subhanAllah and said, O Prophet of Allah, this prayer of yours to your Lord will suffice you and he will fulfill what he has promised you. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the following verse. When ye appeal to your Lord for help, he responded to your call. I will help you with 1,000 angels in succession. SubhanAllah. Ibn Ishaq mentions the Prophet ﷺ fell asleep while supplicating. After a short while, the Prophet ﷺ woke up and said to Abu Bakr, he said, Abshir ya Abu Bakr. Glad tidings to you, Abu Bakr. Ataka Nasrullahi. Allah's help has come to you. Hada Jibreel. This is Jibreel alayhi salam. He is holding the rein of his horse. Yaquduhu ala thanayahul ghubar. And there is dust on his teeth. Subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down 1,000 angels initially. Then 3,000. Then 5,000 to help the Muslim army. You can see from this slide the path the angels took when they entered the battlefield. Now you might be thinking here, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send down so many angels? In a narration from Ibn Abbas, it which is mentioned in the Layl al-Bayhaqi, it mentioned that Iblis had come with his army to help the mushrikeen in the form of Suraqa bin Malik. And his army came in the form of the people of the Bani Madlaj. Therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down Jibreel alayhi salam, Mika'il alayhi salam, Nisrafil alayhi salam, leading the army of angels. Also the question may be asked, isn't one angel enough? The answer has been given in Fatul Bari. We have to remember that this world that we live in is called the Alam Asbab. Therefore there are certain ways, certain laws. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes these into account and then uses his power and displays his power keeping these laws in mind. Therefore an army of angels were sent. It is also mentioned in numerous narrations that the angels had come on horses. In some narrations it mentions the description of these horses and the word uses ablaq, which means piebald, which means black and white. Abu Usaid Sa'adi radiallahu mentions that on the day the angels had come down with yellow turbans and the ends were loose between their shoulders. Others have mentioned that their turbans were black and others have mentioned that they were white. Hafiz Suyuti mentions that the actual color was yellow as the narrations which mentioned they were black or white were weak. In the narration in Muslim Sharif, Ibn Abbas mentions that a Muslim rang behind a mushrik. So this is in the battlefield. And from above he heard the sound of a whip and the sound of someone riding. He heard him say, go ahead, Hazu. After that he laid eye on the mushrik and found him lying on the floor. He could see that there was a mark on his nose and his face as if someone had whipped him. The Ansari came and told the Prophet Sallallahu the whole incident. The Prophet Sallallahu said, you have said the truth. This was help from the third heaven. So this was help from the angels. Ibn Ishaq mentions that the first person to be martyred from the Muslims on that day was Mihja, the freed slave of Hazrat Umar radiallahu Then, Harith ibn Suraqa was also martyred. Both of them had been shot with arrows. Prophet وسلم, came out of his tent and encouraged the army and he said, I swear on the one in whose hand Muhammad وسلم's life is. A person will not get killed today, fighting with patience and the intention of gaining reward going forward, not turning his back, except Allah will enter him into Jannah. 
Umair bin Hamam at that time had some dates in his hand and he was beating, busy eating them. As soon as he heard these words, these words touched his ears, he said, Bakh Bakh, which means Wahwa. He said, what distance is left between me and Jannah except that they kill me? SubhanAllah. He threw the dates from his hand. He took his sword and threw himself into the battlefield until he was martyred. SubhanAllah. After Uthba, Shaiba and Walid were killed, Abu Jahal rallied his troops. He said to them that don't worry about Uthba, Shaiba and Walid getting killed. Those people hurried matters. I swear by Lat and Uzza that we won't return until we have tied them up with ropes. He then supplicated to Allah and said, Destroy the one who cuts the ties of kinship and commits actions which aren't recognized. And whoever is most beloved and liked by you, give him your victory and help. So on one side you have Abu Jahl supplicating to Allah, on the other side you have our Prophet also supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jibreel salam then commanded the Prophet to throw a fistful of dust at the faces of the mushrikeen. He then ordered the Muslims to attack. And there was a one person in the army where the dust hadn't reached their eyes, mouth and nose. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what was in the dust. As soon as it reached them, they started to run. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Anfal verse 17, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْرَمْ إِذْرَمَيْتَ And you did not throw when you threw, meaning the dust. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَرَى But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala threw it. This means that even though our Prophet sallallahu was the one who threw the dust, it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who made this dust reach the mouth, the eyes and the noses of those 1,000 people in the army. Now as soon as the dust reached them, the whole army became in disarray. Every person was wondering where and how they could escape. Even the bravest of their soldiers started to fall and get taken prisoner. Umayyah bin Khalaf was one of the greatest enemies of Islam of the Prophet Even before there was any thought of the Battle of Badr, he had already been told of his demise by Hazrat Sa'ad bin Mu'ad anhu. He had tried to make every excuse possible not to come to the battle but finally gave in due to the taunts of Abu Jahl. So now he's on the plains of Badr and Bilal radiallahu eyes fall upon him. Umayyah had been the cause of so much hardship, so much torture. He used to lay Bilal radiallahu on boiling stones. As soon as Bilal radiallahu saw him, he called the Ansar. Hazrat Abdul Rahman bin Auf radiallahu had been Umayyah's friend in the days of ignorance, in the days of Jahiliyyah. And he didn't want Umayyah to get killed. He thought it would be better if Umayyah gets arrested, becomes a prisoner of war. And maybe in this way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide him and make it a means for him to escape punishment. So Abdul Rahman bin Auf radiallahu took hold of Umayyah and his son. When the Ansar came, Abdul Rahman bin Auf sent Umayyah's son forward and he fell. Then he started to run towards Umayyah. Abdul Rahman bin Auf lay down on top of him, but even this did not stop the Ansar who managed to get to Umayyah from under him. And in this process, Abdul Rahman bin Auf also got injured and the injuries on his feet and the signs of this injury stayed with him for a long time after. As Abdul Rahman bin Auf mentions that he was standing in Badr when he saw two youngsters from the Ansar on his right and left. Therefore he felt anxious. In case someone saw him standing between two boys and that might leave him vulnerable. He was in that thought when one of the youngsters said to him quietly, he said, Uncle, show me who Abu Jahl is. Who is he? I said, Oh nephew, what are you going to do if you see him? The boy said, that he has taken an oath with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if he sees him, then either he will put an end to him or he will die. I have heard that he had said some very bad things about the Prophet sallallahu After hearing these words, the anxiousness that he had standing between the two boys went away. As Abdul Rahman bin Awf says that he pointed towards Abu Jahl and the two boys fell upon Abu Jahl and completed their task. And these two boys were none other than the sons of Afra radiallahu ta'ala anha, Hazza Mu'adh and Mu'awad radiallahu ta'ala anhumah. 
Now Ikrimah, the son of Abu Jahl, came to the aid of his father and struck Mu'ad radiallahu in such a way that one of his hands became grievously injured. He could not use his hand ever again. Even in this condition, he carried on fighting. And he remained alive till the Khilafah of Uthman radiallahu Now Ikrimah incidentally accepted Islam at the time of Fath Makkah and went on to become a great general of Islam. Mu'awwad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Mu'ad radiallahu brother, continued to fight until putting, after putting an end to Abu Jahl until he became martyred. Abu Jahl had become mortally wounded, but there were still signs of life in him. After the battle had finished, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Is there anyone who can bring me news of Abu Jahl? As Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala went out to look for him and found that there was still some life in him. In one narration it mentions that Abdullah bin Mas'ud sat on his chest, meaning sat on Abu Jahl's chest. And Abu Jahl opened his eyes. He said to him, he said, O oh goat herder, you are sat on a high place. So this is what Abu Jahl said to Hazrat Abdullah bin Mas'ud. He said, O oh goat herder, you are sat on a high place. Hazrat Abdullah bin Mas'ud said, I said, all praise to the one who gave me the ability. Abu Jahl then asked him, who won the battle? I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. Then he asked, what is your intention? I said, to put an end to matters quickly, meaning to put an end to Abu Jahl. He said, this is my sword. Use this. It is very sharp. It will fulfill your wishes very quickly and make sure you remove my head near from my shoulders so that people will be able to see me. And when you go to the Prophet wasallam, send him this message. Tell him that in my heart, the enmity, and hatred I had for you yesterday is even more today. Abdullah bin Mas'ud says, I went to the Prophet and gave him his message. Prophet said the takbir, Allahu Akbar. And said that this person was my and my people's Fir'aun. His evil and corruption was even more than the evil and corruption of the Fir'aun in the time of Musa. When that Fir'aun died, at the time of his death, he admitted the truth. But this Fir'aun, meaning Abu Jahl, even at the time of his death, he mentioned words of pride and disbelief. A Prophet وسلم, then gave Abu Jahl's sword to Abdullah bin Mas'ud. Another miracle of our Prophet وسلم, on this day was related to Ukasha. Ukasha had fought bravely on the day of Badr until his sword had broken in his hand. He came to our Prophet ﷺ and our Prophet ﷺ gave him a twine made out of wood, meaning a branch, and told Ukasha to fight with this. When he took the sword, it became long in his hand and turned into white metal. He fought with this sword until the Muslims became victorious and this sword was called al aun he continued to use his sword until he was martyred. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought victory to the Muslim army and the fighting stopped. Seventy people from the Quraysh had fallen and a further seventy had been taken prisoners of war. And how many more had been injured? Only Allah knows. A total of 14 companions of the Prophet had become martyred. If any of you goes to Badr today, then there is a large plaque which contains the names of these martyrs and the names of these illustrious companions were Umair bin Abi Waqas, Safwan bin Wahab, Dhu Shamalain bin Abdi Amr, Mihja bin Salih, Aqil bin al Faqir, Ubaidid bin Harith, Sa'ad bin Khaythama, Mubashir bin Abdul Mandir, Harith ibn Suraqa, Rafi' bin al Ma'ala, Umair bin al Hamam, Yazid bin al Harith, Ma'ubad bin al Harith, and Awf bin Al-Harith radiallahu ta'ala anhum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of them the high status in Jannah. It is narrated by Anas bin Malik and Abu Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhum that on the day of Badr, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa gave the order that the bodies of 24 of the leaders of Quraysh who had fallen on this day be thrown into a well. Now this well was very unclean. It was very, very dirty. And the name of this well was Al-Qalib. We will listen to one of the reasons why later on. The rest of the fallen were put elsewhere. What had started out as a mission to protect a caravan from a group of Muslims who were not prepared for a proper conflict ended up 
as a total defeat for the Quraysh. The Quraysh returned to Mecca without many of its leaders. Many of them had fallen that day, including Abu Jahal, Umayyah bin Khalaf, Utbah, and Sheba bin Rabi'ah to name a few. Many more had sustained injuries. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered our Prophet dua and granted the Muslims a comprehensive victory. He sent down angels to help the army and keep the religion of Islam alive. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept the sacrifices of our Prophet wasallam and all the companions and their families who take part in this great battle of Badr. Inshallah, in the next session, we shall talk about what happened with the spoils of war, what happened with the prisoners of war, and what happened in the aftermath of the greatest battle in Islam, the Battle of Badr. Jazakallah khair. Wa akhra da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa atubu alayhi.